uh, with this, I would now like to call upon a very, very uh, close associate and uh, friend of ICBC, uh, EDC, Expert Development Corporation of Canada, uh, based in India, but uh, Mr. Ladislaw Papara, who is the chief representative in India for EDC. He is at the moment in Canada, but we are looking forward to welcoming him to India soon in person. So Ladislaw, over to you. Thank you, Nadira, and thank you, everyone. Uh, could you hear me? Yes, very Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. So I'm just uh, going to take a couple of minutes to introduce myself and to introduce what EDC is doing in market these days. Uh, so thank you for giving me that opportunity. So again, my name is Ladi Slopapar. I'm the new chief representative for India, uh, working for EDC. Um, uh, a little bit about myself. I have an international finance and business development background. Uh, and I have worked on India transactions for the last seven years. So I'm looking forward to moving to India with uh, my family, uh, with my wife and my two young kids to Mumbai, maybe early next uh, early next year, uh, once this whole situation stabilizes. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with EDC, we are uh, Canada's export credit agency. Uh, we are headquartered in Ottawa. Um, we have just celebrated our 75th year anniversary of being in business. And the uh, reach that we have is uh, 19 in international representations and 20 uh, offices across Canada helping Canadian exporters, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, with their trade. Um, in India, we have presence in Mumbai and in Delhi, and we work very closely with the Trade Commissioner Service um, uh, in the country. We do help Canadian companies of all sizes. Uh, to do business in India. Uh, last year, we have helped about 470 customers, of which three quarters were small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, in terms of our impact in the market, our loan book, our current loan book, is about $3.5 billion. Uh, and we lend to the top-tier corporates in India, so the Tata group of companies, uh, Aditya Verla Group, and uh, Mahindra and Mahindra, uh, among others. With the... Uh, just a second, it looks like there's some audio issues. I'm just going to raise my volume here. Um, with the uh, COVID crisis, you know, we were all disrupted. I mean, the entire ecosystem ha has been uh, disrupted. And just like many other countries around the world, Canada has focused first, first and foremost on uh, helping our Canadian exporters um, survive this, this uh, challenge. Uh, so I would say um, for the last few months, uh, we were a little bit more inward looking. Uh, but nevertheless, we have not uh, neglected our sort of India portfolio. We have made sure to maintain what we have. Uh, what we are doing right now in a sort of post-COVID environment, we are doubling down um, on the market, our efforts on the market, uh, and we are looking to see what other emerging sectors um, we will focus on. So we see significant potential in India for agri-food, uh, for e-commerce, uh, telecommunications, and AI as well as infrastructure opportunities and renewables. So this is where large Canadian um, investors at pension funds uh, currently have a presence. So, you know, with, without further ado, we have strong relations in India and uh, we will continue to leverage these going forward, including our relationship with ICBC. And uh, we're, we're gonna look to partner with everyone else to, um, you know, open trade um, doors for trade to Canada and encourage Indian companies to invest in, uh, Indian companies to invest in uh, Canada as well. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ladislaw. We do look forward to working with EDC and with you uh, in the near future. Uh, incidentally, September 2020 marks 50 years of Milton Friedman's seminal essay on corporate purpose that says there is one and only one social responsibility of business. To use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in open and free competition without deception fraud. One company that comes immediately to mind when we talk about this is CGI, which has always put on par social responsibility with business objectives. I would like to call upon Mr. Sudhir Subbaraman, Senior Vice President and Business Unit Leader Asia Pacific of CGI to throw light on the theme for today. Sudhir also happens to be the CSR champion of CGI in the APAC region. Over to you, Sudhir. 
Thank you so much, uh, Nadira. Can you hear me okay? Very well. Thank you. And uh, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, just wanted to take uh, a couple of minutes in terms of what CGI uh, does for the folks uh, who are not familiar with it. So we are a Canadian multinational um, predominantly focused in IT and uh, you know, in business process consulting uh, across the world. Uh, we have about 80,000 members uh, globally and in India, we have about 15,000 uh, and we've been in India uh, for the last uh, 30 odd years. So, so uh, and, and in that context, um, you know, the, sort of our role in the community is pretty important, pretty prominent in terms of um, giving back to where we live and work. And uh, it's also one of our foundational values, one of our six values uh, that we believe in CJ as well. So, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, sort of the topic, uh, in terms of the, the sort of the best practices from a corporate perspective, uh, there are sort of two things I wanted to, uh, you know, sort of uh, call out and uh, one in terms of what we've been able to do and one in terms of what is a work in progress and I'm looking for other corporates, uh, you know, to sort of embrace the second thing, which is a work in progress. Uh, so first in terms of, uh, um, you know, our, what we've been able to do, um, uh, being sort of a late participant uh, in, in the communities and we sort of really, to be honest, uh, took off after the companies that came into play. Uh, our journey into, uh, into CSR and communities has been, uh, you know, in the last two years in a really sustainable way, in a really impactful way. You know, we've always, as other companies have done this on and off in terms of volunteers uh, from our members and so on. Uh, but since sort of this became part of our mission, part of our value statement, uh, we really wanted to do something that was meaningful, impactful, and that's a sustain, uh, sustainable. So being a late uh, comer, we took uh, advantage of uh, what are other companies doing in India? Uh, how are they actually able to do it? What are some of the lessons learned? What are some things not to do? And uh, what we realized uh, is that um, we just don't want to throw money in terms of projects like the, the PM Relief Fund. I'm pretty sure that has its own belief and, and reasons, but we really wanted to uh, ensure that whatever we did, we wanted to see the impact. We wanted our members to be part of the process uh, and so on. So we sort of took a three-prone approach based on learnings uh, and, uh, and what we observed, uh, what other companies were doing in the market. And the three-prone approach was uh, sort of embedded into every project that we did. So the so first thing was, we really wanted to ensure there was um, you know, communication awareness creation. So it was uh, you know, very important that we really did that in every project we did. Uh, we also wanted to sort of uh, have collaboration. And it was, this isn't about, it's just us as corporate and the and the NGO, the partner working with us, but we wanted to bring in a collection of NGOs and partners. And the third thing was uh, sustainability right from the project. You know, it can be sustainability as an afterthought, we wanted to have sustainability right from the get-go. So, so every project we design, we deliver, has uh, you know a strong elements of communication, collaboration, and sustainability right from the get-go. So, in that context, uh, what these three does is sort of a force multiplier, rather than creating a project, touching it, and leaving and going. Uh, it sort of ensures that the right partners are brought in at the right time, and then sustainability is sort of brought in from the the get-go. And, and, and sort of a case in point, uh, so when we worked with the school in Chennai, which is a blind school, uh, we helped them in terms of uh, sustainability from, uh, you know, their electricity through solar and, uh, and also from their curriculum. Uh, by actually bringing in teaching aids from other partner institutions. So that it's it's a lab that we given. And at the end of the day, it's great to have a photo shoot and move on in life, uh, but we didn't want to stop that. We want to ensure that the lab actually gets used, the right curriculum is being designed. And also, you know, in, in the future, there is challenges, in, in, especially in Chennai, there's a lot of flower fluctuations. And we want to ensure that that, the, that education institution is self-sustaining. So, so this is sort of an example of uh, how we've done a force multiplier. And, and, and honestly, we just learned this based on the do's and don'ts, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, what we have seen in uh, CSR and in, in corporates working with uh, the social sector. The second one I wanted to sort of, uh, you know, talk about, and it's an important one, uh, and we're still learning it, uh, which is um, when we work with the social sector, uh, the lens that we impose on on the social sector, uh, and I learned this from one of my um, uh, one of my professors, is uh, it's called QSQT. It's not the movie, the QSQT, uh, but it's quarter say quarter tak. So it is it is sort of the belief that we corporate live by month, live by quarter, and we try to impose that on the social sector. But the social sector problems are, are fairly complex, fairly dynamic. And uh, while it is important 
uh, to have that sort of a perspective. But what happens because the social sector tries to respond back with results that way, it is actually not sustainable. It is actually not realistic. And it in turn creates a huge trust deficit on what corporates relies on the social sector and then social sector thinks about the corporate. So, so we've tried to have a, a, a sort of, of a quarter mentality, but in terms of, you know, sort of agile results, things that are short term, quick leading indicators, but we are also learning to work with the social sector uh, in terms of uh, being able to deliver something long term. And uh, that's a learning for us. We're still learning through that and to sort of let go of that QSQT mentality and uh, and then not to have social sector come back to us with that lens, but to sort of work together in terms of having a short term QSQD perspective, but then have a long term uh, sort of an impact in the society because these are not quarterly problems. These are not annual report problems. These are problems that have been there for centuries, ages. And uh, and then we as corporates have a responsibility to where uh, it's not about a photo shoot and opportunity. We do our part, but also ensure that we are also there leaving a footprint that will stay for generations to come. So that's those are the two things I wanted to quickly talk, Nadira, in terms of uh, the, the session for today. And thanks for the opportunity again. Thank you, Sudhir. Thank you for giving us that. And the QSQT, I love that, but we will use that from now on. Uh, and also, a big thank you to CGI for their, you know, for their support, consistent support to the chamber right from when, when we started. Uh, okay, so going ahead, uh, Canada has been a leader in bringing a collaborative and an institutional framework to corporate and individual philanthropy. Hilary Pearson is the president and CEO of Philanthropic Foundations Canada since 2001. Hilary has championed the practice of effective grant making and the important role of organized philanthropy in supporting communities, especially during stressed situations such as the COVID-19. Uh, such institutional arrangements help coordinate and mobilize philanthropy to reach the neediest at a scale that really makes a difference. India, on the other hand, has had a tradition of individual philanthropy based on individual firms and founders. Adel Give is one of India's first corporate foundations of Edelweiss, which through its work brings together NGOs that are working on certain themes and donors who want to contribute. The CEO of Adel Give, Ms. Vidya Shah, is starting to transform India's nascent philanthropic world to a more organized one, as Hillary Pearson has created in Canada. We are really fortunate today to have both Hillary and Vidya to exchange views on why the work they do is so important in changing people's lives, both the beneficiaries and the donors. Over to you, Vidya, to formally introduce Hillary and take the session forward. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Nadira, uh, for having me here and Anita as well. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure uh, to uh, introduce Hilary, who I had actually the good fortune uh, to meet in January. And, you know, while I'll talk to you about all her achievements in the last uh, 20 years of her career in foundation philanthropy in Canada, I must say I was very, very impressed with not only her knowledge, but her em empathy and her keen desire to learn about the nonprofit and the development sector in India from an ecosystem lens. So she's been the founding president of Philanthropic Foundations Canada for almost 18 years. And she's worked with many of the largest private charitable foundations uh, in the country. She's been strategic advisor and facilitator for many of the family foundations in their work to understand the landscape, develop their goals and structure their governance and grant making practices. She's been the author of numerous articles and reviews on foundation philanthropy. And she speaks frequently at conferences and workshops, both in Canada and globally. In her role at PFC, she's edited comprehensive guides to starting and managing foundations, as well as guides for funders working with governments, with universities, and in policy advocacy. She has extensive knowledge of uh, federal public policy regarding chari charities, 
and she serves as co-chair of the advisory committee on the charitable sector, advising the federal government on policy and regulatory issues. In January 2018, she was appointed to the Order of Canada for her contributions to building the field of philanthropy in Canada. She's also uh, she's, uh, she's served as director on many national nonprofit boards of uh, directors, including Imagine Canada, the Stratford Shakespeare Festival of Canada, Care Canada, and Inspire. She chairs the advisory body of the Cody Institute, which is a very impressive institute at St. Francis Xavier University. And she serves on the advisory committee to the Masters in Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership at Carlton University. So in, 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 in short, basically, I think she has a 360 degree, degree view of philanthropy, both from the lens of nonprofits, from the lens of funders, from the lens of governments and policymakers. And that's why I think it's an absolute pleasure to have you, Hillary, uh, here today to talk to us and to give us your views on how you're seeing the world of philanthropy evolve, especially in these troubling times of COVID. Over to you, Hillary. Uh, thank you very much, Vidya. And it's really nice to see you too, if only virtually. <laughs> Uh, and Anita as well. Hello, Anita. And, uh, and Nadira, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, hi, as Vidya said, I came to India in January and uh, I'm so fortunate that I did because who knew what 2020 was going to bring us. Uh, and I guess uh, we won't be traveling again for a while, but um, we certainly, my husband and I both plan to come back to India as soon as we possibly can. Um, it's uh, very much uh, a country that both of us love and um, that we feel affinity towards. So uh, we're really looking forward to seeing you again. Uh, so I, I was asked to uh, speak, hopefully it'll be fairly brief, um, and then Vidya and I are going to talk a little bit. Um, but in particular, I was asked to speak today about uh, the, the corporate uh, view of social good and what is the business community's view of its role in creating social impact and uh, what how do we see that playing out certainly the pandemic i think is going to accelerate certain uh trends that were already present in the corporate world uh, around engaging in social impact activity where it's too soon i think to say exactly how we're going to see a change but i'm sure that we will see a change um, but let me speak to you um, in, in more general terms, I think about, uh, I guess, ideas of um, uh, stakeholder capitalism, essentially. And that's kind of the debate that's going on, I think, in the in the business world today. So forgive me for I'll go on for a little bit and then Vidya and I are going to have a, <clears throat> a bit of an exchange. So let me start by saying, uh, by asking a question are the most successful corporations those that focus primarily on the financial value that they create for shareholders? Or can they be even more successful if they integrate social and environmental as well as financial value creation into their thinking and practice? Put another way, are companies more successful when they define their purpose in social as well as business terms? These are important questions for companies today. According to a recent book that I read and, and reviewed actually for a publication here in Canada called The Philanthropist, it's a book called The Corporate Social Mind. And there's good evidence in this, uh, according to this book, for a strong yes to the idea that companies are indeed more successful when they take on a social purpose. The authors, authors of this book suggest the possibility of creating what they call an integrated corporate social mind that brings together a company's assets and skills for business and social impact, an approach that makes life better for people and society. They believe that it's possible and necessary to break down the silos that separate corporate social responsibility units and or corporate foundations, which typically are sort of hived off uh, from other parts of of the company to bring together those units and the typical business functions of production, research and development, investment, marketing, and sales. 
And while the authors come at this from a very practical perspective, their thinking is part of the topical current debate around reimagining capitalism for sustainability and the long term. A business with a corporate social mind, according to them, incorporates social impact into every aspect of its work. Uh, you might say that was impossible, but there are many examples of companies that exhibit a corporate social mind already. And there are some big multinational corporations, Salesforce, Levi Strauss, uh, Danone, Mondelez, uh, Siemens. Uh, in India, we could suggest Mahindra or Wipro or Edelweiss actually, and, and others. And these traits of, their, of the corporate social mind are similar to the mindsets more typically associated with nonprofit organizations, uh, articulated lived values, a focus on benefit to society, a willingness to get close to or listen to beneficiaries, a willingness to work collaboratively, the courage to advocate, the commitment to measurement of impact, an openness to innovation. Interestingly, the qualities of business leadership that are identified by the co-authors of the book also resonate with nonprofit leaders. Authenticity, bravery, patience, trust, commitment. I think there's a changing public awareness of the social issues that matter to consumers. There are greater public expectations of companies to advance social progress on issues beyond the immediate business needs of the company. Businesses don't exist in a vacuum. Companies have relationships with the communities in which their employees and their customers live. Companies exist in a green natural environment that can destroy or enhance their assets or supply lines. Companies need strong governments and courts to support and protect their assets and their employees. Companies need to recruit and hold on to motivated employees. All of these needs propel companies to act in ways that go beyond business itself. Research data reveals a particularly strong awareness and emphasis by the public on corporate commitment to environmental sustainability. We have seen a shift of business towards sustainability in production, in reductions in plastic packaging, greater attention to corporate operational, uh, to corporate operational impacts on water, air, on the earth that we walk on. But there is much more going on in the business world around social purpose than what might be cynically viewed as greenwashing activity. A socially minded corporation can have impacts on mental and physical health, education, housing, protection of rights, support for the most vulnerable, social justice and inclusion, all of which are things that one would think more typical of the nonprofit world. I think it's important to say that we see more collaboration across sectors and co-creation with others, whether in innovation labs or in settings where leaders are open to cross boundary thinking, whether it's reduction of plastic in the environment, designing education curricula and technologies that open doors for marginalized youth, creating more opportunities to access good food and advice on nutrition. Collaboration across sectors amplifies resources and affords scale. Similarly, business innovation and social innovation can build on each other for social good. Nonprofit leaders could open new possibilities for their work if they think about corporations not just as sponsors, event donors, or sources of volunteers for projects, but as partners in design, delivery, and even advocacy, depending on the issue. I would hope to see more discussion on the role of markets and investors, not just consumers, in shaping a corporate social mindset. Investors and markets recognize that companies that are environmental polluters and carbon consumers are running reputational and consumer risks. Initiatives by major investors such as Climate Action Plus, which is a large group of uh, investors, push it, are, they're pushing corporations to take action on climate change. But investors do not yet reward corporations that are actively pursuing social as well as business goals. And this touches on the running debate over capitalism for the long term versus the short term. Until markets and investors themselves begin to value and rate a corporate social mindset as an asset, business leaders may see it as a sideline and not as the main show. CSR and corporate philanthropy will remain important, but not integrated add-ons. Nevertheless, there is room for optimism. We may see a turning tide in the boardroom as millennial consumers demand more social action and the world goes through the shock of the pandemic 
uh, that upends thinking about sustainability, about the needs of the most vulnerable, social injustice, and the roles of government, business, and civil society. Leading Indian companies and foundations, such as Wipro and Azim Premji Foundation, Mahindra, and KC Mahindra Education Trust, Edelweiss, and Edelgive Foundation, they're committed to constructing new models and approaches using evidence, measurement, experimentation, and demonstration. They're not replacing government, but they're working alongside it, taking well-planned risks and working with community and public sector partners for the long term on the leverage points that will transform public systems. One has to conclude that this is a corporate social mindset at work in India. And it's not just a function of the government mandated CSR contribution under the Companies Act, although this has clearly been important. These corporate initiatives are carefully thought out collaborative strategies with nonprofit sector organizations and platforms. I believe that these companies have considered what societal challenges they can address in ways that build on their business innovation and corporate values. Indian business has much to offer us in Canada in applying a corporate social mindset. And I'd love to talk more about this. Uh, so in conclusion, thank you again, uh, Vidya, Nadira, Anita, um, and I'm so pleased to be joining all of you today. Uh, and I look forward to some conversation. Thank you, Elodie. That was, uh, you know, that was very impressive in terms of, you know, the, the attention you've paid, uh, especially to bringing out the balance, uh, you know, between doing good in business, but also doing good uh, for society and not really seeing that as conflict, but right. finding ways of, uh, you know, uh, finding that balance rather than looking at it as you could do just one or the other. Uh, I had a, just a couple of questions. Uh, and one of them was, you know, I think a lot of what you spoke about actually emphasizes the role of corporate as well as governmental leadership, you know, in driving mm -hmm. this balance uh, between business and social impact. It almost seems as if uh, the companies who actually chose to drive this balance, they did not do it just because it would be you know, good for market capitalization or profits or reputation. But I think somewhere the leadership believed that it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. so I'd just like to really hear your views on this because it really has an impact on how we and how boards really choose, uh, you know, their leaders. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about this. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. Very good point, Vidya. And I think when you look at it, um, when you look at the profiles of, of the uh, companies that are leaders in uh, creating uh, social impact as well as, as business impact, um, it, it is the people leading those companies, you know, who are the most forceful uh, spokespeople. Uh, and, Jim Collins said this in Good to Great, you know, many years ago now. He, he focused on the leaders of the companies that he was profiling. When he talked about great companies, he talked about the leaders of those companies and their values and how they express their values uh, and, and how they, their integrity uh, created a corporate culture that was committed, an, an integrated corporate culture that was committed to uh, considering social impact as well as business impact. You know, great companies were created by great leaders. So you can think today of the impact of a guy like um, Paul Pullman at Unilever, uh, who left Unilever a year or so ago. But Paul Pullman is, uh, he created a, a company that had has had tremendous returns, great for shareholders. Unilever is universally respected as a company, but he's also someone who's Im immensely committed to social impact and who spoke out while he was CEO of Unilever. Uh, I think he has led uh, the effort in the business world to commit to the sustainable development goals. Uh, he's used the, the idea that metrics and measurement, uh, this is important, the setting goals that are measurable is important in creating social impact, but, but creating them uh, not only as part of a set of business metrics, but as your sustainable development metrics uh, and how you contribute to, to the world. Um, that was an important idea for Unilever and it's been an important idea in the business world. And Pullman actually has gone on, he did he retire from Unilever, but he's gone on to create something called Imagine, which some of you might have seen or, or have learned about, um, which is a, it's a B Corp. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consulting 
consultants see, but you know, really working with CEOs, continuing to work with CEOs around the world on the idea of the, the, kind of the corporate social mindset. So that's an example, I think, of a corporate leader who is, has had striking impact uh, in, his, in his environment, beyond his, his own corporate environment. Oh, I think I think that's a great uh, that's a great example. And actually, I had the good fortune to meet Paul Colpin uh, a few years ago in Cambridge when he came to speak about ESG and uh, the importance of uh, you know uh, of this balance that we were speaking about. Mm -hmm. And in the context of ESG, we're really seeing. Uh, and you spoke about how you know there's a new investor class perhaps that's emerging that's really demanding this balance. And we're seeing the emergence of ESG norms recently, even in India, though uh, the NSC needed some ESG form filings for the top 100 listed companies. I think there's a lot more work going on now on clear, you know, cleaning that and ensuring that a lot more companies, uh, not just voluntarily, but mandatorily, you know, as, uh, prescribe uh, or ascribe to these uh, norms. And I think this demand is also coming from the side of funds and investors. Mm -hmm. We believe that these issues are important and they're important enough to drive their own investment philosophy. I was just reading just today, CSCI Bank context. Almost one third of the flows now, you know, to funds are actually coming to ESG funds, which is just showing how investors are reacting, uh, mm -hmm. demanding to this, uh, demanding this balance. And it's there's uh, there's a line there saying that global funds investing in India will increasingly be ESG focused. Mm -hmm. Asset managers are only getting started. Um, and so, what I'd really like to uh, know is from you is you know how are you seeing this theme pan out uh, in the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a fascinating area. It's 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 moving very quickly. Uh, certainly, in the time that I was involved in philanthropy uh, at PFC, I saw a, an enormous shift in the interest that Canadian foundations had in thinking about uh, ESG investing and impact investing more broadly. I think it's fair to say that um, there's still a lot of hesitation around what really constitutes impact investing, you know, how do you know when an investment is truly uh, an impact investment? And, and there's a controversy, I would say, in the philanthropy world uh, between the foundations who say, actually, it's not about selecting investments that have a specific ESG focus or that one could call impact investing. It's about using your power as an investor across asset classes, across companies to move um, move the thinking of, and so this is a bit the Pul Pullman idea as well, you know, that you have to move the thinking of companies that are not themselves thinking of themselves as having a, um, an ESG focus or, or, or taking environmental and social and governance uh, um, factors into, um, into their business planning. But in fact, it's, it's, and I think this is what the book, The Corporate Social Mindset is also getting at, is integrating across all of your business activity, the notion that what you do beyond the short term and beyond the immediate activity that you're engaged in. And you know, I think that idea is, I think rippling out now. Uh, I, I see a tremendous amount of activity in the, uh, in, in the impact investing space. But what I see it doing is morphing into broadly into the investment space. So that asset managers are not saying it's a competitive advantage just for us to have an ESG fund over here. You know, and investors, we can sort of put a little bit of their money into a little bit of this fund, none of, none of which is really central to us, but we'll greenwash it. You know, we'll, we'll make it sound as if we are part of this movement. I actually think now it's percolating back you know, this may be optimistic on my part, but I, I actually do see it moving. And I think the pandemic and climate change and the impact of climate change now is beginning to really start to affect capital markets. So, you know, I think that now foundations are going to be, and I'm just talking about foundations, I know them best, but, you know, the they as investors, but also pension funds. 
And, you know, I'm looking at Anita, who I know so well, you know, with the Caisse de Depot in um, uh, Quebec, you know, the Caisse de Depot started to deploy a massive amount of its assets uh, through uh, uh, an environmental lens. Now that makes a difference. Foundations at the end of the day, philanthropy at the end of the day, is not, you know, the asset uh, size of philanthropy, even the largest, you know, foundations, when you add them all up, then nothing uh, comparison to, you know, large pension funds around the world. If you move them, you move much. And so when a guy like Larry Fink, you know, at BlackRock says, we really have to be thinking about this and we do need to be applying this lens across all of our investments, then you see big change happening. Ronald Cohen, Sir Ronald Cohen in the UK, who of course for a long time has been uh, leading the way, I think, in, in terms of talking about social capital, you know, is now saying actually it's not about cap, it's not about social capital, it's capital in, in the way in which you deploy capital for purpose. And I think thinking that way, thinking more broadly is, is you know, what is going to really make the difference. And we may see an explosion of change uh, you know, in ways that we had not expected. Again, the pandemic, I think, might accelerate some of this. I'm hoping so. You know, there, there have to be some good things coming out of this pandemic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Hilary, because I think we could have gone on, but I know yeah. Sarah's waiting for us to, uh, you know, to hand over to Anita. Thank you so much, Hilary, for being with us this, uh, this evening, your morning. I'm sure it's early for you. But thank you so Not much. Not that early. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilary and Vidya. Really a fascinating conversation. And for all the uh, 90 or so participants and many corporates, both from Canada and India, uh, this is really giving us food for thought, particularly in these COVID times. Uh, to think about how we can integrate uh, social purpose and business. And I think this is something that will be really, really uh, um, inspiring as well as motivating for corporates to do more in this area. As you mentioned, uh, the pension funds, uh, CDPQ is leading uh, investor network called the Investor Leadership Network, which is committed to all of these aspects of trying to make sure that we mainstream social purpose within the act investment activities. And I think that's really what's going to start moving the needle and making a difference, which we so badly need. So it gives me great pleasure to hear you both. And I hope this is an ongoing conversation um, that ICBC can continue to promote as we can, there's a lot to be done and I think all of us can contribute to it. And thank you very much for taking the time, both of you, uh, to give us this excellent conversation and food for thought. It was I, a pleasure. <laughs> and also thank you, Anita, for, come, for you know, uh, having these two ladies here. Uh, thanks to you, I got connected to them and we've had this fabulous conversation. And uh, Anita, I'd also like you to say a few words as the incoming president of ICBC from your side to our guests and members who are here today. Thank you, Nadira. It's really an honor for me to be uh, appointed as the president of ICBC. And today is my first public event. And it's uh, really for me uh, telling that uh, the first topic of discussion is what we just heard about. Uh, because I, I truly believe that as corporate, unless we mainstream and bring social purpose, uh, we are going to be um, facing even harder times than what we've just gone through. So we do have no choice but to do what Hillary and uh, Vidya were suggesting. And I'm, I really thank you, Nadira and ICBC. I have to say two words about ICBC and what motivated me to join as president. Since I've come back to India representing CDPQ, I have seen the work of ICBC, which is tremendous as a platform. You brought together Indian companies, Canadian companies, and really 
brought a conversation which has promoted tangible results for both sides. And we very much value that, Nadra, and I want to give a shout out to you and to your whole team who do a fabulous job. So for me, it's actually a great honor and a pleasure to take on this role as president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. And uh, uh, now um, I just want to say that we are extremely privileged at this time to have with us Mr. Nadir Godrej as the keynote speaker. He's an active champion of social responsibility and Mr. Nadir Godrej, there could be no one better than you today to have joined us for this event. And we are, you know, we're really looking forward to hearing your insights and your vision. But to introduce you formally, let me call upon Ms. Kashmira Mevawala. Uh, she's on the National Board of Directors of ICBC and also from Tata Capital. Uh, Kashmira, please step in and give Mr. Nadir Godrich his due to be introduced from. Thank you, Nadira. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Anita, once again. And uh, thank you for all our members and other guests who are present today. It is my honor to welcome and to introduce Mr. Nadir Godrich, Managing Director, Godrich Industries, and Chairman Godrich Agrovet. Mr. Godrich is an alumni of the Standard University and the Harvard Business School. He's been on the boards of several Godrich companies since 1977 and has developed the animal feed, the agricultural inputs, chemicals business of Godrej Industries. He's also very devoted to continue driving research in a very big way. He serves as an independent director on many other large listed companies as well. Mr. Godrej has been the recipient of many awards, including the Chevalier de Légion d'Honneur from the Government of France, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Oil Technology Association of India, the All India Liquid Bulk Importers and Exporters Association, the Chemtech Leadership and Excellence Award. Uh, the Porter Prize of 2013 awarded to the Godrej Industries was also received by Mr. Godrej. Mr. Godrej is deeply committed to good and green strategies and is dedicated to achieving the set targets in his area for the Godrej Group. He encourages and supports a shared vision value for all programs of good and green. On a personal and a more interesting front, he enjoys the complexity of science, the challenges of linguistics, and more importantly, poetry. He is a talented poet. And I've been privileged to have received one of his poems. I don't know if you remember that, Mr. Godrej. He has also authored Life and Other Poems and Nadir Godrej, the poet, a collection of English and French poems. Please Google them. They're very interesting videos on this. Mr. Godrej, on behalf of the Indo-Canada Business Chamber, the ICBC, I once again welcome you at this, at this event. We, we would be delighted to hear your thoughts on responsible leadership at Godrej, talking about the history, the vision of the group, the meaningful activities that have impacted societies over the years. Maybe a little bit about the Godrej Foundation, which probably was based on the vision of the founders, your efforts and those of other leaders that have ensured that this philosophy of care care for communities, care for the environment, of creating opportunities and skilling of the underprivileged is sustained through an institutionalized process where responsible leadership thrives to make its mark. Thank you for being with us once again, Mr. Godrej. We're really honored to have you and over to you. Thank you. I think you're on mute, Mr. Godrej. Still on mute? Yeah, that's fine. According to Steven Pinker, and supported by many a thinker, the world's becoming a better place, though at a slow but steady pace. And yet, there are problems for sure. And climate change is at the fore. Inequality is also dire, and maybe getting much higher. If progress on all these is slow, the consequences are grave, we know. Their abilities and constraints are such that governments can't do much. NGOs have few means but ability, and businesses have means but don't see these issues as part of their core, for profits is how they would score. But businesses slowly realize that profits are a short-term prize. After all, what do businesses gain? if they die out and do not sustain. But how much can they afford to spend 
to ensure their existence doesn't end. The answer is not easy to find, but a thought still comes to mind. If the efforts of all are combined, the synergies that we find reduces cost, raises gain, and obviates inevitable pain. There is a capitalistic strain that enthrones shareholder gain. And Milton Friedman could see that this simplistic philosophy could lead to great efficiency. But wherever there's externality, this capitalism, red in tooth and claw, can prove to be a dismal flaw. Correction can come from regulation or even from self-remediation. And Adam Smith himself foresaw that business could address this flaw. It should be clearly understood. One can do well by doing good. Doing it smartly, we do better. So why not be the trendsetter? In capitalism's early days, we see social responsibility in some degree, not from the Anglican perch, but from the nonconformist church. To dissipate the urban gloom, both Cadbury, Lord Lever Hume, then pioneered the company town. Some observers would surely frown at their extremely paternal attitude, but many might view it with gratitude. We should remember in that age, it compensated their lowly wage. It's time to get the Tata group now very much into the loop. Because it seemed morally right, the Tata group then set its sight at such a very lofty height for what trade unions had to fight in Europe for several years was gifted by these worthy seers from the goodness of their heart. Undoubtedly this played a part in honing their great reputation and then contributing to the nation. And doing good is very sound. What goes around does come around. Doing good isn't just a cost. The gain outweighs all that's lost. My grandfather probably saw these examples and found no flaw. He brought far away marshy land. His critics just couldn't understand. They concluded he had gone quite mad. But today we are glad, not sad. A township then slowly arose. And this is where our business grows. We provide every needed tool, housing, hospital, and school. My uncle, known as SPG, way back could clearly see the environment was under stress. Neglect he knew would be a mess. Our creekside land was preserved. Our creekside land was reserved, the mangroves there well preserved. And from my office, I gaze out there, a Mumbai view that's very rare, with greenery all the way, until you sight New Bombay. And now and then with friends I float on a gently moving boat with pink flamingos in full flight to my mind a splendid sight. In saving tigers, he played a role. The environment was a major goal. The Tata Trusts, as we all know, get a very constant flow of dividends from shares they own. It may not be quite as well known. Our trusts also have a share. The proportion's smaller, but it's there. And here I think we all ought to pay careful heed to Michael Porter. With shared value, there's no cost for doing good as nothing's lost. All it takes is a thinking brain to remove a societal pain and combine it with a business gain to create a sustainable chain of endless mutual benefit. This concept is a tremendous hit. We thought that we should also try and see if we could apply this philosophy to our group. Our employees also joined the loop. In the year 2010, studies were commissioned and then with the help of Tustra and FSG, our new program one could see, we aptly named it Good and Green and what a journey it has been. And how do we define our role? What could be a proper goal? Now the UN has a lengthy list. So in recounting, some would be missed. So I will focus on just three that I think would be the key for all the others to fall in place and enable us to win the race. Good health through perfect sanitation, environment and education, all of these can be seen in our program, Good and Green. And so without partiality, our goal for all is neutrality, whether water, carbon or solid waste, by 2020, we will make haste 
to make our net emissions zero. Will that make the group a hero? In 2010, the goal looked tall, but we took a reasoned call. Technology would save the day. So far, it has turned out that way. As technology takes a leap, green energy gets very cheap. Keen observers quickly saw that soda also tracks Moore's law. With a groundnut shell or the gas, our India's full of biomass. At first, we thought we'd have to spend, but that's not true, for in the end, the more we thought and the more we slaved, we did invest, but we also saved. And solar is still getting cheaper. And as we start digging deeper, in India, it will hit the goal of being cheaper than even coal in just a handful of years. Already, we and our peers are sourcing solar electricity at lower rates than from the utility. For quite some time, we've been exporting as their finances aren't still sorted. A silver lining can be seen since it incentivizes green. Offsets help elimination and rural electrification with distributed solar power is now the need of the hour. Our cost of water is not so high, but yet we do attempt to try to reduce our water consumption. But all the same, it's a safe assumption. Our water use won't disappear. And so to be neutral, I fear, we will have to mitigate. For so fortunately, I can state that developing a watershed doesn't cost much and instead our agribusiness can benefit. The government will do its bit, but where it fails, we'll fill the breach and hopefully we will reach many farmers on the cheap, but the benefits that we reap will compensate for the cost and once again, nothing's lost. Our partner here is our Trump card. It is none other than Nabad. There are many parts that we can see for achieving carbon neutrality. The cheapest way is certainly through energy efficiency. Real interest rates are rather low and high returns quickly flow from any energy saving device. For business, this is very nice. Not only are returns quite brisk, there's also very little risk. In India, mandated CSR can help us go very far. Multiple benefits is what one sees with water projects or growing trees. Good livelihoods are created, our carbon emissions are abated, trees planted at a river source maintain the flow throughout its course. So many benefits we can see. The preservation of biodiversity. Different species can be tried. Useful products can be supplied like biomass or edible fruits. And yet the trunk and the roots can sequester carbon, clean the air, a win-win that is very fair. So while we decarbonize, why not also monetize? So never fall for either or. Our hearts and minds demand much more. Neutrality can come with ease. Some may think I'm a tease. Some companies are not yet sold. For some it's tough, or so I'm told. Energy intensive firms would say it's tougher then for them to play. If you can turn all waste to gold, and if you can be very bold with inventing technology, any industry can see eventual neutrality. And there is so much more to gain if it's across our entire chain. The case, of course, is very clear. And yet we are nowhere near any kind of firm solution to end greenhouse gas pollution. Around the world, we would find so many leaders that are blind or perhaps not so benighted but conveniently short-sighted. Why undergo any pain if by the time you get the gain, you will no longer be around? To politicos, this may seem sound. Prevention is much better than cure. So learn it now or then endure the endless pain and aggravation of the heavy cost of adaptation. If you neutralize at a cost, Competitively, much is lost. A uniform carbon tax would protect all our banks. But bear in mind, it's not a cost. For the economy, nothing's lost. A UBI could be instated. Some other tax could be rebated. And if this is indeed just so, each economy would still grow.
Now, with the right advocacy, someday soon we could see an enabling global policy that would encourage us to be quite carbon neutral with no pain. The world can only stand to gain. We can be fair to every nation, avoid the cost of adaptation. But if we don't collaborate, we can't escape this sorry state. Now COVID opened up our eyes. Let's hope that we've become quite wise. We saw the benefits of green, but something else was also seen. The different outcomes we could see because of inequality. Can COVID then act as a spur? Now, couldn't it help to stir our hearts and minds to newer heights with ESG now in our sights? The vision that we should now share is a brave new world, both green and fair. Lack of health and education leads to the perpetuation of inequality through generations in almost all of our nations. Without good health, you never learn. If you don't learn, you cannot earn. For health as well as climate change, it certainly isn't strange that prevention's better than a cure. On public health, we should spend. It is much cheaper in the end. With little cost and greatest ease, we could reduce lifestyle disease. At any rate, I'm quite sure we would spend less than for a cure. In order to achieve this goal, businesses could play a role through business models and CSR, together we can go quite far. And similarly through education, we can serve ourselves and the nation. We often think that charity can address disparity, but tackling health and education are better means for alleviation. Through action and advocacy, we can help all humanity to create a world that's just and fair and everyone is free to share nature's bounty and be fulfilled. And then I'm sure we'd all be thrilled. People can also volunteer. Together, all of us can steer a world in which there's harmony between business and society. A mutual reinforcing loop benefiting every group. All of us can forge ahead if we only learn to shed the barriers that can divide. And if cooperation stride with the help of business, I foresee a helpful, thriving society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godrish. That was inspiring, motivational, unique. I think we are all just thrilled to hear from you. And now, um, you know, I will come back to this a little later. Just want to mention that now we'll transition from one Nadar to another. We have now joining us His Excellency Nadar Patel, High Commissioner of Canada to India, a very dynamic person, a great support to the chamber, a patron to our chamber, and we really value his support. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, Anita George, our uh, new president of ICBC, to introduce uh, Mr. Nadar Patel, ask him to say a few words, and then I would like to introduce Mr. Godridge to our board of directors here. Over to you, Anita. Thank you very much, Nadira. I think this is the day of uh, Nadir's and Nadira's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, but I, I have to deviate for one minute to say that, Mr. Godrej, that was amazing. Uh, really, we hope that the brave new world, more green and fair, does come about. And that's what this whole theme for today has been. And uh, hearing from Hilary, Vidya, and yourself, I think all of us corporates and financiers stand inspired. Moving to a very, very uh, source of big inspiration for us is High Commissioner Nadar Patel. I have to say that although he needs no introduction to the ICBC team and to all our participants, uh, Mr. Nadar Patel is really the example par excellence of a High Commissioner who has supported this chamber, the ICBC chamber, very, very actively 
Uh, we call upon him all the time and he's always there for us. Um, he has really, if you look at any aspect of the relationship between Canada and India, Mr. Nader Patel's efforts has uh, really made significant change and significant improvements. Uh, I can talk about not just the growth in trade, in investments. I'm always proud to say that thanks to his proactive support and that of his team, the uh, pension funds from Canada and the long-term investors from Canada have invested $50 billion over the last couple of years. And a large part of that credit goes to the hard work of um, his High Commissioner, Mr. Nader Patel. I would also like to say that um, High Commissioner Nader Patel has been an example of the difference that good leadership can make. And uh, Hillary spoke about Paul Polman and Unilever. I have to say, um, Mr. Nader Patel's leadership has really taken the Canada-India relationship to a new high, and we hope that that continues for the next several decades to come. Thank you, and a warm welcome, High Commissioner Patel. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anita, for such a, a warm uh, welcome and for your uh, remarks. Um, First of all, uh, let me just say it's great to be here again. Um, I think this is my fifth or sixth AGM. I've lost count now, and I was supposed to have been back in Canada for the last two, and yet here I am still here. So it's always great to uh, continue on this tradition. Uh, let me also extend my very, very warm congratulations to you, Anita, for your uh, appointment as president. We look forward to further deepening the relationship and the role that ICBC plays. Um, to my namesake, Nadir Godrej, um, let me just say that in the entire time that I've been here or any other moment in my public service career, I, and I've seen a lot of speeches and I've given a lot of speeches, I don't think I have heard anything so inspiring and so um, uh, something that will stick. Um, so absolutely fantastic. Um, and uh, so I, I, uh, I just set aside my scripted remarks now and I won't use them because <laughs> <laughs> it uh, you set the bar to a new level so absolutely fantastic thank you so much for taking the time to be here uh, this evening um, to show uh, a level of commitment and support to the Canadian Indo-Canadian Business Chamber and, uh, and we look forward to uh, further uh, engaging with uh, your group um, in any way that we can to help uh, advance some of the interests, not only in India, but hopefully uh, into Canada as well. So um, really, really great to meet you here. And uh, I, I'll be very honest with you. I do have a bias and a soft spot for anybody that has the same name that I do. This is why Nadira gets uh, a lot of extra kudos from the High Commission these days. So um, let, let, let me... Um, let me just offer up a few very brief remarks. Um, I, I wanted to, first of all, be here to uh, once again extend uh, the High Commission and by extension the Government of Canada support for the work that ICBC does. Uh, and I recall, you know, uh, upon my arrival here about six years ago, whatever it was now, you know, uh, going from uh, a relatively young organization based in Delhi with a number of uh, members to now hundreds of members, chapters all over the country, and very active not only in India, but also in Canada, um, I think um, is very telling of uh, the work that ICBC has done. During that same span, as many of you know, um, every year we have hit record numbers in terms of every single business metric that you can think of in terms of Canada, India, uh, commercial relations, investment, trade, trade in goods, trade in services, um, move, movement of people, educational ties, number of companies, everything hit record numbers. So, um, and I've said this before and I'll say this again, um, that is largely a result of business leaders stepping up, taking advantage of the opportunities, um, but helped or bolstered or amplified by the work that chambers do both here in India and also in Canada. So um, I think this is, um, uh, it, it's no coincidence that the trajectory of growth in our relationship going from, you know, a 
four or five billion in in two way trade in goods to over you know twelve billion dollars, and then the investment story, of course, sixty billion dollars in Canadian investment coming here over that period of time. It's no coincidence that um, engagement um, has grown with the chamber as well as the overall relationship. So. Um, thank you, and we'll continue to, to amplify our efforts as ambassadors, as diplomats, as trade commissioners, and leverage the work that the Chamber, your members, and your councils, and your board uh, uh, does. So uh, great to be here for the annual general meeting to be able to articulate some of that uh, support and, and messaging. Um, a few things I'll just touch on briefly. One is the last several months, of course, have been challenging for all of us. Um, and it's been really great and impressive to see how ICBC from the first, uh, from the early days of the pandemic to the early days of lockdown, um, how the organization has adapted to a new way of doing business, you know, a virtual presence, virtual events and webinars and whatnot. Um, I'm convinced like any crisis, there will be an end and we have to ride out this, um, period of uncertainty, uh, which will continue extending into a number of months ahead of us as well. So uh, being able to adapt, I think, is absolutely critical. And ICBC has done that. Businesses have done that. Um, and uh, and we'll continue to uh, uh, amplify our efforts through these types of uh, events. But, but really great to see that happen. Um, in terms of where we're at right now, I, I was speaking at an event a few days ago, the Toronto Board of Trade um, had an annual summit on, sorry, I had a summit, special summit on recovery. And, and, and one of the questions that was asked is, you know, what is it that keeps me up at night or what is it that's very much on my mind as it relates to, you know, economic growth and recovery? And, and I said there, and I'll say it now because I think it's probably very telling, it sets the tone. Um, I touched on this growth, this record trade investment over the last several years and one of the biggest challenges is to not lose that momentum going forward right the pandemic has provided uh some roadblocks and some bumps along the way and we want to ensure that our efforts as trade commissioners and diplomats are there to um, ensure that canadian companies canadian investors are able to uh ride out this storm over the next 12 to 18 months in particular you know it's it's a matter of ensuring that the work that has been done is salvaged that we can survive through this phase so that we can come out on the other end and then thrive again so how do you maintain that momentum and i think that's going to be very very key um so there's a, a few elements to that first of all um we are re-strategizing refocusing where our efforts need to be placed. You know, what is it that we can do for you as business leaders, Indian business leaders, Canadian business leaders, um, to support, sustain uh, your existing investments, your operations, and grow if there's an opportunity to do so. Um, you know, a few years, a few months ago, pre-pandemic, we were really focused on growth and business development. Today, it's a little bit more about nurturing and ensuring that we provide the level of support to sustain. And, uh, and if we do that, then that growth will resume or return at, at, at some point later. So we're refocusing our efforts, trying to adapt to what it is that companies are gonna need from us. Um, we're also being very realistic about what we can and cannot achieve. You know, We are looking at uh, being staffed a little bit lower than what we would normally for the rest of this um, Posting year until next summer. Um, so that means, you know, we'll only focus on what our clients want us to focus on. Um, it'll be more along the lines of what absolutely needs to happen and uh, what is achievable. Um, but it also means that we need to do things differently. You know, the traditional trade fairs and getting out on the road are replaced by things like this, you know, and uh, but you can do that. You can deliver those services in different ways. Um, we're also looking a little bit more along the lines of um, going beyond uh, our traditional long-term thinking. Now, you know, long-term continues to be very important for us um, and we won't lose sight of that. But, you know, what I used to say to Canadian business leaders is for India, you have to have a long-term outlook. And our investors are a good example, you know, including Anita's organization, CDPQ and others, you know, you're looking at this market 
not from a three, four, five year horizon, but 20, 25 years um, down the road. So we won't lose sight of that, but I think it's entirely reasonable right now to look at the short term, which traditionally has been a bit more of a, of a risk. Um, but I think it's important that we look at just navigating the next 12 to 18 months um, and, uh, and, and more so than ever before. So I think that's gonna be very, very important. And that's something that we will want to continue to, uh, uh, to focus on. And then finally, I think um, a word about, you know, Canada-India relations overall. Um, in the time that I've been High Commissioner, I don't think the relationship has been stronger than it is now. There is a tremendous level of uh, engagement happening across the board, um, not just commercial uh, relations. Um, our uh, trade negotiators have resumed discussions. Our investment uh, negotiators, our investment treaty negotiators are in touch with each other. Um, our ministers are in regular contact, our foreign minister, our commerce ministers, the prime ministers have spoken a few times over the last several months. Um, so uh, we are um, very much uh, focused on um, ensuring that, that momentum of this reignited relationship continues. Um, no doubt both India and Canada are very keen to see uh, things move in a certain direction, uh, a very ambitious direction. And I think part of that is also complemented or amplified by COVID-19. Um, you know, we, we, we realize that you can be self-reliant, but not protectionist. You can be more successful at navigating crises together with partners than you can if you go it alone. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that quite uh, handily. We're seeing a number of events, a number of opportunities for virtual discussions take place in the coming weeks and months. And, uh, and you'll see more engagement at the ministerial uh, level, uh, the political level, as well as we uh, navigate some of the ongoing challenges of uh, COVID uh, as well. So um, th that's a little bit of uh, a quick snapshot of what's on my mind or our minds right now. Um, and certainly we remain available to all of you um, in terms of any services, support, advice uh, that we can provide. Um, and, uh, and, and as I said before, um, it's not just about Canadian companies here. It's also about Indian companies looking to do business or that are doing business back in Canada. So take advantage of us, take advantage of our trade commissioners. And, um, we're also amplifying our presence on the ground with folks in Ottawa, um, who can back up on some additional uh, measures given, you know, a shorter footprint, a smaller footprint that we have, uh, right now. So um, on that note, uh, let me once again congratulate the Chamber for a very successful year. Uh, I think you're uh, once again in extremely steady and capable hands with a, a new president. And uh, it'll be a challenging year on many fronts, but another one to look forward to and be very excited about. Um, and you have our full unconditional support uh, for all your initiatives to ensure that not only are you successful, but you continue to contribute to our success as well. So once again, thank you. And uh, Mr. Godridge, thank you very much once again. Very impressive. Um, I'm going to uh, start uh, exploring uh, uh, with my speechwriters um, a bit of a different approach going forward. So uh, uh, you've inspired me very, very much. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, thank you, Nadir. Uh, thank you very much for all your words. And I just wanted to assure you that uh, the momentum will not slow down. We are here to support you and the India-Canada Economic Corridor will go on with our support and with your leadership. And with Anita's leadership to the Chamber, I'm sure we will reach new levels. Uh, Mr. Nadir Godred just messaged uh, on the chat saying that Nadir means unique, but today it is ubiquitous. So I think it's true that there are a lot of us here today, but uh, Mr. Goddard, it was an honor to hear your words and to have you with us. And as uh, Sanadar Patel said, yes, you have set a new level. We will all need to redo how we speak to be able to measure up to your standards. Um, with this, I just would like to now um, uh, end this part of the session, but I would like to, I think Hilary Pearson had to leave because she had another meeting. I don't know if she's still here, but I would have liked to introduce her to both uh, both uh, Mr. Godridge and uh, Mr. Patel. Uh, she's 
had a very inspiring spoke very in a very inspiring manner and we were very happy to have her here with us um, may i just now announce uh, our new our board of directors and if uh, it is possible i don't know whether anybody can say hello otherwise at least you could just say uh, hello to them so we have uh, our uh, president anita george right here who has been uh, here throughout uh, we have rakesh nangya uh, he is here also with us so rakesh just wave uh, we have kashmira mevawala who is here also so kashmira wave from you uh, we have uh, Sanjeev Mittal, I, I don't know if you can get him. Um, if not, uh, Arun Pandya, who's head of Air Canada. Uh, you could Ar just pause for two seconds after each name. I'm unmuting them. They can probably come on and say hello. Okay. Even if they can just the uh, video, that's enough, I think. Or a hello. Arun? Arun Pandya? Start going to Apurva. Apurva Mehta. Hi, good evening. Good morning. We have Chiranjeev Patel. Chiranjeev, would you like to unmute and just say hello? Okay, let me go on to Sanjeev Mittal. Hi, Nadra. Yeah. Hi, Sanjeev. Glad to have you on our board. Most grateful, Nadra, and heartiest congratulations to Anita uh, once again uh, on, on this forum, most grateful that Anita has decided to honor the chairmanship of, uh, chairpersonship of ICBC once, uh, and, and it will be a great honor to work in, in her leadership to in ICBC. Thank you very much, Anita. Thank you, Sanjeev. Okay. Uh, Raghav Kanoria, Saurabh Bhatia, Ari Prabhu, and Ritika Modi. Ron to Basu. Uh, Arun is has also. So Arun, would you like to say a word? I. Uh... Hello, Nadira. Yes, Arun, we can hear you. Yeah. What an amazing AGM. I have to say, very well organized and very, very uh, important speakers, very important topics. And a great welcome to Anita for taking over as president. And I'm sure ICBC is going to go places with her as the president, the new president of uh, the chamber. Uh, I'm still trying to see how we can collaborate in Canada for the roadshow. So my proposal has gone, which you sent me. And I'm hoping that we get some collaboration of some kind uh, for these roadshows, virtual roadshow. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Rontu, I think you've unmuted yourself. So would you like to speak? Yes. So good evening, everyone, to both the Nadirs, Nadira. Congratulations, Anita, again. Uh, look forward to the next year. Thank you, Rontu. So I think uh, Shivani, if there's uh, no one I think Chiranjeev could not unmute, so uh, we'll just uh, move on. I uh, just want to thank again um, everybody who, has, who was here with us today. Um, as we go through these uncertain times, that with every challenge comes an opportunity. I'm confident in our ability to seize these opportunities and tide over the adversity. I express my gratitude to our members and friends for their continued support in these difficult times and hope that this time next year we will be able to meet in person for our AGM. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board for their continued support and guidance. And meanwhile, I hope all of you and your families stay well and safe. So thank you very much, everybody. And I must, uh, yeah, before we end, I must say that we also have uh, the High Commissioner is the patron of the Chamber and Andrew Smith, Minister Commercial for the Canadian High Commission uh, in India, is our de facto member on the National Board. So, uh, Andrew, if you are around, you could say hi to us. 
so otherwise we will move on now and uh, uh, your excellency just want to thank you once again for your support and wish you a very safe time for you and your families everybody thank you anita rakesh thanks thank you. Thank you everybody you all Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nadira. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Anita, thank once you. again. Mr. Thank Godrej, you. thank you once again. Thank you, Mr. Godrej. Thank you, Mr. Godrej. Thank you for being with us. Bye -bye. A big thank time. you all. Have a good weekend. Thank yes. you. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.